Welcome to another episode of The Christian Report. My name is Vincent Hewlin. Now, as always on The Christian Report, whether it be Matt or Stephen or myself that's hosting the show, we always give you our personal cell phone number. The reason why we do that is because we want dialogue. If you have a Bible question, I promise you we're going to do everything we can to give you a Bible answer. We will never answer any of your Bible questions with, well, this is how we think, or this is how we feel, or this is what we believe. We're going to do nothing more than find the answer to your Bible questions right out of the Bible. So that way you're getting nothing but the truth. Well, in this episode of the Christian Report, after much study with many people, I'd like to present to you a lesson called, Who Were the Ten Commandments Really For? Who were the Ten Commandments really for? We have many people today that they have uh, the Ten Commandments hanging up in their house. And, and many people today will say, well, I live by the Ten Commandments. Even when I was growing up in North Arkansas where we didn't have cable TV or anything, but I remember occasionally we, were get, we got to watch a movie. One of my favorite movies, one of the movies that to this day I still can recall was the Ten Commandments. Uh, Charlton Heston played the part of Moses. I've always liked Charlton Heston as a, an actor. And the thing is that when I, when I recall watching that movie as a, as a young child, I can remember what parts of the movie like when Moses, uh, uh, through, with the hand of God, was parting the, the Red Sea. And, and, and the children of Israel, you know, they were fleeing from Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea and... Uh, you know, the, the, the Egyptian soldiers came in behind him and the, and the sea collapsed on him and killed him. And, and just those, those parts of the movie stuck with, still stick with me today. But, the, you know, even though that was a really good movie and, and, and a lot of it's biblically, biblically correct, those Ten Commandments that, that Moses really received in the Bible and, and he gave them to a certain people, who were they really for? Are they for us today? That's what our study is going to be about. You know, the Ten Commandments, we're very familiar with them. You know, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Shall not steal. Shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Thou shalt not covet the neighbor's house, nor anything um, that is uh, thy neighbor's. Now, I purposely left out one. I purposely left out the fourth one because the nine that, that I just quoted, well, we see those, not word for word, but kind of carried into the dispensation in the testament that we live in today. You know, after Christ died on the cross and, and he established the church, Acts chapter 2, where we live now, you know, we, these are familiar to us. But number four is really not that familiar to us. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, these Ten Commandments, these, the original ten, who were they for? Who were they written to? That's what our study's about. So get your Bibles open, get your notepads open. Let's study the Word of God together. We're going to go back to Exodus chapter 34, verses 27 through 28. Let's read this together because we want to read about the covenant, or a covenant is nothing more than a contract or the testament, that was made between God and a specific people. Exodus 34, 27 through 28. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words. For after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee, Moses, and with Israel. So who is the Lord going to make this covenant with? With Moses and with Israel. Correct? Verse 28, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the ta the tables or the tablets, if you use uh, like American Standard Version, he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Okay, so we see God making a covenant with a certain people, with Moses and the Israelites, right? And what is this covenant? It's the beginning of a total of 613 commandments. This is the first 10 commandments. 
Now, another example. So we have no one can go away after this lesson and say, I don't get it. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. Okay, we're going to read about this contract again, this covenant with the Lord. And he declared unto you, who is he speaking to? The Israelites. He declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you, Israelites, even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time, who wrote this? You know, this was uh, Moses. And, he, and the Lord commanded me at this time to teach you, who? The Israelites, statutes and judgments, that ye, who, Israelites, might do them in the land whether ye, who, the Israelites, go over to possess it. So once again, who's this covenant with? With Moses and with the Israelites. There's no doubt about that. Right? Absolutely. So this covenant, this contract that the Lord made with Moses and the Lord and the and the Israelites was this was this covenant conditional. That's the question. Does it still exist today? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. It's written, Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God. He said, okay, take heed. Don't forget this. Lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image, or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. Now, in this passage, he is reminding them of, of you know, one of the, the commandments that was given to him in the first 10. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, as we know, we, you know hindsight's twenty twenty. We can look back and see what the Israelites did, and multiple times they did this, even to the point where they were passing their own children in fire. That means they were sacrificing their own children to Moloch, a false god. Well, let's keep going with our study. Verse 24, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. And to this day, he's the same way. He hasn't changed. We know that. Verse 25, When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger. So we can see this is conditional. He says, you know, take heed and says, lest ye forget. Well, let's continue with our study. The big question is, this was a very clear warning that the Lord gave them. Did the Israelites break this covenant? We'll be looking at Jeremiah 31, 31 through 32. Jeremiah writes, Behold, now, he's writing the words of the Lord now. Let's listen. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, why would the Lord need to make a new covenant? He made one with them when he led them out of Egypt, right? He started with those Ten Commandments. Let's just keep reading. Verse 32, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. The children of Israel broke this covenant. Although, this is the Lord speaking, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Did they break this covenant? The Bible says that they did. It's very simple for us to see that. Did God establish the new covenant? Like what we read, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. All we got to do is keep studying. Study to show thyself approved, right? A new covenant will be established. We go to Isaiah, another prophet, and he's writing what the Lord is telling him to communicate. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6. I, the Lord, hath called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of, of, of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. So now this covenant is, is going to extend even past the Israelites. It's going to be given to the Gentiles. I'm not an Israelite. I'm a Gentile. This covenant is even going to be with me. We go to Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 10, and we see where this covenant will never be removed. It There's no condition to it. You know, when we see the terminology forever, that means an indeterminate amount of time. But when we see where it's never going to be removed, it's everlasting because Christ, as we know, is sitting on his throne now, all right, so the people of this new covenant are going to be called by a new name. This is exciting, folks. 
Get your pencils ready. Mark this in your Bible in the margins. We're about to make a great connection. Isaiah 62, verse 1 and 2. For Zion's sake, Zion the mountain in Jerusalem, for Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation therefore as a lamp that burneth. Man, we know who's talking about. Jesus the Christ. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. And all kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. So these people, that it's going to be part of this new covenant. It's going to be, as we read, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, as well as the Gentiles, and this new covenant, they're going to be called by a new name. And this name is not going to be a man-made name. This name is going to be given from the mouth of the Lord. The Lord's going to name this name. What is this new name? Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And we had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Singular, remember that. One church, the church, and taught much people. And the disciples, the disciples of who? Christ. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. What does the name Christian mean? It means a follower of Christ, to be Christ-like, a disciple of Christ, those who have been added to the church. As we've, as we've discussed so many times in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, the Lord adds you to the church. You're not voted in, nothing else. Only the Lord can add you. What were these people called? They were called Christians. They were called Christians and nothing else. They were not called Baptist. They were not called Methodist. They were not called Episcopalian. They were not called Catholics. They were not called Pentecostals. They were not called New Lifers. They were not called Seventh-day Adventists. They were not called Jehovah Witnesses. They were not called Mormons. They weren't called Greek Orthodoxes or Orthodoxes, depending on however you want to say it. The fact of it is, all of these names, you'll see, was not a name given by the Lord. These are man-made names. The Lord calls them Christians. These folks will say, but we are Christians. You go to ask them, Hey, what denomination are you? Well, I'm a Baptist. You ask me, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. And if I'm in the wrong, I want to do what's right. If I find out that I'm doing what's wrong, I'm going to repent. I want to do what's right. Everyone should be willing to just follow Jesus, correct? Absolutely. So back to what this lesson's about. The big question is, does the old covenant continue today? With Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Jesus says, Think not that I <clears throat> excuse me, think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus says he didn't come to destroy that old law. I'm talking about the old law, the old covenant, the old testament. He didn't come to destroy it, he came to fulfill it. So Jesus came to fulfill the old law. What does fulfill mean? We've got to go back to the original Greek text and see what the Greek word is for fulfill. We find out that it's pleru, which the definition of that Greek word pleru, which means to satisfy, to finish, to complete. What Jesus is saying, think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to satisfy, to finish, to make it complete. How did Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, fulfill, satisfy, complete that old law? The Bible tells us, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Blotting out the hand, remember, my friends, Paul's writing this letter, this epistle, to the church in Colossae. They are Gentiles. Just like the letter he wrote to the Ephesians, they're Gentiles. He's writing this, and he says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was past tense against us. What handwriting of ordinances was against the Gentiles? The Old Testament. It wasn't for Gentiles. It was for the Israelites. We just read this. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. How did our Lord and Savior take that Old Testament, that old law, and take it out of the way? Nailed it to his cross. That's how my Jesus did it. He nailed it to his cross. More proof. We got to keep going. We got to keep studying the Bible to study. We have to study to show ourselves approved unto God. 
Galatians chapter 3, verses 22 through 27. Now, a, a little bit deeper subject to get a broader aspect of what Paul's communicating to the churches. This isn't a single church in Galatia. Remember, uh, when he wrote this letter to Galatia, he was writing it to uh, Asia Minor. This is multiple congregations of the Lord's church. And it's a big area. And he's writing to them this letter because they're struggling with the same problem that people are having today, that they want to adopt those Old Testament um, uh, laws, those commandments from the Old Testament, and they want to incorporate it into the New Testament. Read all, read all of, of that letter that Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia. Let's just look at Galatians 3, 22 through 27 for the sake of time. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Messiah. He was the long-awaited Messiah. But before faith came, the faith in Jesus. Remember, what is our faith in Jesus? That he is the Messiah. He died on the cross. He was buried and he resurrected from the grave. That's the gospel. But before faith came, the faith in Jesus, we were kept under the law. What law? The Old Testament. Shut up unto the faith, because Jesus hadn't come yet. Shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. How was Jesus revealed? He conquered the grave. Wherefore, the law was, past tense, our schoolmaster, which means tutor. The, the law, talking about the Old Testament, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. By what faith? Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If Jesus would have died on that cross and never conquered the grave, he'd just been another man being crucified. But when Jesus Christ conquered the grave, he fulfilled prophecy. He proved that he was the Messiah. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. That schoolmaster is the old law that brought us unto Christ. Once faith came, once Jesus came, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. Paul goes on to communicate for ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You're, you're a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus. He goes on to say, for as, many of you has, uh, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Why are we baptized? Well, the Bible says for the remission of sins. But why do I get baptized? Because I have faith. I, I'm not a murderer because of my faith. I don't commit adultery because of my faith. I obey Jesus because of my faith. We're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Folks, this is easy. And then Paul communicates in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Folks, we got people that say, well, I just want to hold on to some of that old law. Vincent, this is not a big deal. And, and you know, it's not going to anger God if I just hold on to like, if I just want to keep the, the, the Sabbath holy. I'm going to do it right. You know, at 6 p.m. On, on Friday, I'm going to start my Sabbath. Not at sundown. That was the seventh day. I just changed that in the late 1860s. At 6 p.m., uh, because we have to look at the, the, right, the real way the Jewish uh, uh, day went. 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. was the day. 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. was the night. And it began the night before. And they said, I'm going to do it like the Jews did. Or I just want to tithe. I'm, I'm, I want to tithe like the Jews did. You know, and, and, and that's okay. It's not going to, you know... What was tithing? Tithing was a taxation for the Jews. Are you a Jew? Are you living under the old law? Paul writes, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. What is liberty? It's to be free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith God, Christ has made us free and not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What is that yoke of bondage? The Old Testament, the old law. Don't be entangled again with it. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, he's talking about a physical circumcision, not the spiritual, not of the heart. He's talking about physical circumcision like the Jews. Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. You cannot sit there and say, I just want the Sabbath, or I just want to tithe. You get it all, all 613 commandments. You're going to be sacrificing. You're going to be Passover, the Pentecost, the Feast of Booths. You're going to be doing it all. You can't pick and choose. And if you do this, what does he say in verse 4? Christ has become no effect unto you. You're saying, I don't need Christ. If you reach back and take even one bit, because Christ nailed it to his cross. 
Christ has become no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. And the Baptists and so many other denominations will say, well, you can't fall from grace. The Bible just says this is one way you can fall from grace. Who's telling the truth? Your Baptist pastor or the Bible? They contradict each other. One of them's got to be wrong. I'm going to stick with the Lord. I'm going to stick with the Bible. Christ has become no effect on you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, talking about that old law, you're fallen from grace. Oh, boy, I get pumped up with this. So righteousness comes from only the new covenant. This was asked to me. What does the Bible say? It's not my opinion. Paul writes to the churches in Galatia, Galatians 2.21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, talking about the old covenant, then Christ is dead in vain. That means falsely. There was no reason for him to die. Keeping the old law is saying, I don't need Christ's death. It wasn't needed. Who would say that? Why would anyone, why would anyone want to be under a curse from the Lord? As we're about to read, you are cursed if you even try, if you even try to continue with that old covenant. And if you do that, you are not, you are not justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse, uh, yeah, chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. For as many as are of the works, that, work, that word works, I know there's so many denominations, oh, they hate it, works, but all works means is just obedience. People will say works has nothing to do with salvation. It's just obedience. They're saying obedience has nothing to do with salvation. It makes no sense. It goes directly against what Christ says. For as many of you are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You can't pick and choose. you got to take them all. But that no man is justified by the law of the sight of God. You try to stay with the old law, even one part, you're not justified. God didn't recognize that. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. But by what faith? The faith in Jesus Christ. And the law is not a faith. That old law, that Old Testament, it's not a faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. You want one, you get them all. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Because it was nailed to his cross. Being made a curse for us. Man, he loved us. For it is written, this is right out of Deuteronomy 21, 23. For it is written, curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. Why would anybody want to be under a curse? Is Paul a good example for us to follow? We've read these verses before. Paul tells the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. If Paul's following Christ, we can emulate Paul. He's a good Christian, right? He also tells the church in Philippi, Philippians 3, 17, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them. That means identify them. You got to judge whether they're good or bad. Mark them which, you, which walk so you have us, it's more than just him, it's the other disciples of Christ, for an example. So is Paul a good example for us to follow? Absolutely is. Did Paul hold on to any of the old laws that Christ for food? Remember, Paul, he says, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was raised under the feet of Gamaliel. The, a doctor of the law. Once Paul converted to Christianity, he didn't keep the Jews' religion. It's not me saying this. It's the Bible. Galatians 1.13, For you have heard in my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. He didn't say my religion. He says in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Paul also says, Acts 24 and 17, now after many years, I come to bring alms to my nation and offerings. After many years, Deuteronomy 16, 16 says, a good Jew has to go to Jerusalem three times a year. And he can't come empty handed. And he says he hadn't done it in many years. So Paul hasn't been keeping the Passover. Paul hasn't been keeping the Pentecost. Paul hasn't been keeping the Feast of Booths. And Paul hasn't been keeping the Sabbaths. Why would you? Who were the Ten Commandments really for? That's what this show is about. Folks, we read it. We know who those Ten Commandments were really for. Were they for you, for me? Those Ten Commandments were for Moses and the Israelites. They weren't for you. They weren't for me. And they weren't for Charlton Heston. 
that covenant the Lord made was with Moses and the Israelites at that time, and we read in the Bible that, that covenant was broken and God made a new covenant. <clears throat> Oops, I hit the wrong button, didn't I? There we go. All right. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Now, folks, I'm going to ask a very serious question. I'm going to ask everyone watching this show to do some critical thinking. Remember, I've said this before in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. The Lord's talking to, to Isaiah. He says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. I'm going to ask you to reason together. If you are following a religious leader that tells you that you need a tithe or that you need to keep the Passover like Seventh-day Adventists and many people who confess to be Christians, who confess to be followers of Christ, do today. Would you follow a person that teaches something otherwise than what we just read in the Bible, than what we studied? Would you follow them? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3-5, through 5, now, Paul's writing this letter to Timothy. Timothy is a young preacher that he's mentoring, and he delivers a lot of good information to Timothy. And Timothy, as we can study, Timothy takes this information and he shares it with others. Paul's a good example to follow. We just read that. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 and 5. Paul tells Timothy, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and conjunction, and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness. What are these people? He is proud, not knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputes of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw yourself. You don't hang out with people like this. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. John writes this later in life. He's a much older man, much more mature. But he's still doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, he says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. What commandments are we going to keep? Remember, the old commandment was nailed on the cross with Christ. It was fulfilled. You know, it's no different like if you borrow money to buy, say, a car, and you're going to make 10 payments on that car. And you, you have a contract. You're going to make 10 payments of $100. Say it's a $1,000 car. Well, after the 10th payment is made, is the contract fulfilled? It is. Now, it's not destroyed. You have a contract, but you can see where the contract was filled. You're not going to make an 11th payment. There's no reason to. The contract was fulfilled. The contract was satisfied. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. What command we're we going to keep? The New Testament commands, the commands that have been instructed to us from Jesus, from the apostles, what we find in the Bible at the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. And he says, and His commandments are not grievous. They're not hard to follow. Are you going to follow someone who teaches something other than what we find in the Bible? Remember, in John chapter 14, verse 15, this has got to be my, my favorite verse. I quote it so often. It's right above my head. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says to them, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, I know there's many people watching this TV show, and there may be people much time after this airs on TV that are watching this on YouTube. And I know if right now, if any of you, whether now or in the future, I ask you, do you love Jesus? You would say, yes, I love Jesus. You've watched this whole show. But do you love Jesus enough to keep his commandments? That's important to ask. I want to give you our contact information. This is the personal cell phone numbers for Matt, Stephen, and myself. This is also the telephone number for some really good Christians in West Arkansas. They want to hear from you too. We all want to have dialogue with you and answer your Bible questions and help you see the light, help you see the truth. Here's the cable channels that, that we're broadcasting on in Arkansas, the, 
the TV stations, and our email address. If you don't want to contact us by phone or by text, just email us. The Christian Report Today at gmail.com. The Christian Report Today, all one word, at gmail.com. We love you. God bless every one of you, and we pray that you have a great day.